All right, now, what happened in the northwest? Only a tip of the iceberg. Uh, there have been growing similar complaints in other provinces, including Gauteng and the Northern Cape, ANC chairperson in the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamane Sol, my guest tonight, will discuss this and other burning issues at length. And you can be a part of this conversation or take your questions and comments live tonight on 072-110-5584. Drop us a WhatsApp message. We'll call you right back and put you on. Otherwise, you can tweet us tonight at Newsroom405. Dr. Sol, good evening, and thank you very much for your time and joining us tonight here on In Focus. Uh, good evening, Tabo, and uh, good evening to the viewers of Newsroom Africa. And thank you very much for having us here. Quite a busy schedule you have, and we have been putting this request. Finally, uh, we've, we've got to, to speak to you, and we do appreciate that. Are you still upbeat about the uh, elections, despite some members being unhappy with the nominations process? I mean, there's a list doing the rounds on some social media platforms uh, showing 340 disputes. We, we are tremendously optimistic about uh, the outcomes of these elections. Our campaign is building momentum and uh, our, our, our election machinery is firing all cylinders in the province. And uh, we are tremendously optimistic that we are going to perform much better than we did in 2016. Talk to us then about what actually are the challenges uh, that bring about these intense contestations and problems at, at branch level that lead to, to these claims of uh, tempering with the community vote results. The issue of nomination of what candidates, it's a very emotive issue, and particularly in the ANC. I'm certain, uh, Tavo, you and many vote and many viewers of your new of this channel, you don't know how other parties nominate their vote candidates. You would know how the ANC does that. In the ANC, it first starts with an internal process where the branch general meeting nominates about three plus number of people that they would want to present to communities and they present those ones to communities and you've got some kind of primaries that take place where communities are final arbiters and take decisions on who they want to be the one candidate. There's no other party in the country that takes that risk. No other party. It's only the African National Congress. I'm certain nobody, many people don't know how other parties generated their award candidates. The, the only the ANC that has got a mass-based process of identification of award candidates. So you should look at the challenges that we are currently confronted with with regard to that process, yeah. because it's a very emotive process. And yeah. we took a decision to take a serious risk, take this matter to communities, and allow communities to identify their award candidate. It is emotive, a very difficult process, but we are handling it. That's the reason why we've got a award candidate in all 4,000 plus awards in the country. Explain to me then the situation that would lead to, as you're saying, it's a very open process where the community gets to pick a candidate, right? So a, a, yes. a, a, a candidate receives a majority of the votes during the BGM, However, when this particular list is now handed over to the IEC, that candidate is removed from the list. No, if there are such instances, I think our guidelines are very clear. The candidate that has got the majority votes in a community meeting, they become our award candidate. The guidelines are very clear on that. So there is no structure of the ANC that can change the popular will of what voters about who should become their candidate. There are instances of manipulation, as you raise it, that took place, and the ANC National Executive Committee has made a commitment that we are going to investigate those instances, and those who are found to have been involved in wrongdoing, they will be subjected to DC processes, and that word candidate, if you, want, if you win the word, will be asked to resign so that you can call for a by-election. So there's a process which the NEC have laid out if there are instances of manipulation. It's true, there are instances of manipulation because this is a mass-based process which could be easily manipulated. There are RECs that manipulated the process. There are branches that did that. But there's a commitment. We did that in 2016. In 2016, there was a Costa Zana Lamini Zuma Commission which was established by the NEC 
that went right throughout the country to investigate all those cases where issues of what candidates were manipulated. And we had to be, we had to open up for a whole lot of by-elections. There were by-elections in instances where a wrong candidate was, 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 was registered. Yeah. So we are going to do the same. And I hope people of South Africa must understand that this is a difficult process. And I'm certain in the next local government election, yeah. we will be able to master I, I, Are you not concerned? Because this is a persisting thing and it keeps on coming up. And there's a sense and a feeling from some within your own ranks who, who say uh, candidates were handpicked and imposed on them. Uh, and is there no concern from your part that, uh, uh, for example, those members and even communities will 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 uh, reject these imposed candidates and they will punish the ANC at the polls. So I, I don't know what might be happening in other provinces, but in the Northern Cape, there is not even a single candidate that was handpicked because I don't think anyone would have been able to do that. The structures that were put in place, the systems that we embarked on in the identification of these old candidates renders it very difficult for any individual to do that. There are instances where communities are saying there was a vote that took place here. This candidate got the majority of votes, but a different candidate has been registered. We are working on all those cases. Here in the province, I think the number of cases that we have to intensely deal with is about 16 cases. And we are looking hawkishly on those cases. And soon after local government elections, we are going to resolve those cases together with those communities. But I've been right throughout the province during this campaign period. Right throughout the province, there is not even a single region I've not to. I've never come across any single community that say they will punish the ANC on the 1st of November because a wrong candidate was, 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 was registered. In cases where there are wrong candidates that have been registered, we've made a commitment and we will live by that commitment that we are going to resolve the matter and if a wrong candidate is registered, we ask that candidate to resign so that we can put in the right candidate and go through to by-elections. Yeah. Tell us then about your regional vetting process that you have uh, undergone, particularly when it comes to skills and experience. One of the resolutions of the 52nd conference of the ANC was that you want uh, to professionalize public service and therefore you want to also make sure that those counselors uh, that you bring into those wards have capacity. Yes, this is the most diverse uh, list of candidate councillors that we've ever had in the province. Uh, in terms of gender, in, in the national, the national average for gender representation is about 46%, which are women. In the Northern Cape, 51% of our candidates are women, which means we are far above the national average. And also we've got about 25%, which is young people, highly skilled, highly trained, well-educated, who will be able to get on board and add the necessary vibrancy and energy in the work of our councils. But we've got a diverse skills of comrades that have been deployed to serve in, this, in, in, in these municipalities, and particularly with the utilization of the, of the, of the PR list, proportional representative list, where we've roped in comrades from different backgrounds, who've got different skills, accountants, uh, who will be able to assist in these municipalities and strengthen the oversight which councillors are supposed to make. All right, let's take a break. We'll connect once again in a moment uh, with Dr. Zamani So, the chairperson uh, of uh, the ANC in the Northern Cape, but also premier uh, of that uh, province. And he says, as far as he's aware, 16 disputes in that province, but none of them have said they will punish the ANC, but he promises to look closely into those disputes. Let's hear your views. You can tweet us at Newsroom 405. Welcome back. You're live with us tonight here on In Focus, News in Africa, Channel 405. And uh, we are in conversation with Northern Cape uh, ANC chairperson, Dr. Zamani Sol. And, uh, of course, uh, we're taking your thoughts and your views tonight uh, on the burning issues at length and what it is that uh, you would like to put uh, to uh, the Premier there in uh, the Northern Cape. 072-110-5584. Give us your thoughts. We'll put you on live and uh, we'll take uh, your questions uh, tonight. Before the break, still talking about the regional voting process. So, Premier, you're saying you've, you've got quite a diverse um, 
a list of candidates and councillors with, with, with various expertise. But I, I would like to get a sense of how are you verifying their credentials, right? For example, on your um, uh, one of the uh, uh, visits by the president earlier in the year, if not last year, right, he goes to, to uh, uh, Colville in Kimberley and meets a lady there called Lydia Koch who lives in a house with 42 members and uh, in a three-room dwelling. And the president was shocked. He said, no, this is not on. This has got to be rectified, right? Came really hard uh, on, on, on the mayor in, 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 in that particular uh, that region. And uh, is that a capacity issue? How, how do you ensure that the persons that you put in have got the right credentials to be able to, to deliver on the services? Tabo, uh, just today I was with uh, Minister Mamuluku Kubai. And uh, what we did was to go and uh, allocate 420 uh, units to residents to residents in the Ratong Park. Uh, that is part of one of our biggest uh, catalytic project around housing, which it's targeting about 4,200 units. And today we went there for allocation of 420,000, 420 of those units. And two weeks back, she was here in the province and we launched the Hull Street project with, we'll have about 1,300 units. And there's another project on N12, which will be having about 1,300 units. So we are, ramp, we, are, we are ramping up our program on human settlements to ensure that as far as possible, we are going to make provision of decent housing for the people of the Northern Cape, and particularly here in Kimberley, where there is a mushrooming of informal settlements. The report that we received, let me just put what you raised in context. The report that we received from State SA about 10 years back, it says that Northern Cape has got the biggest households in the whole country. What that means is just in one household, you've got about three generations of families which are staying there. Is the, is the father and the mother, their children, and the children of their grandchildren. That's the reason why we are sitting with such a major challenge of big households. But now we are ramping up our human settlements program. We are starting to build houses in earnest. And the program is also firing all cylinders. And we hope that we'll be able to address that problem. Yeah. And what's happening at the, the, the vet dam informal settlements? Uh, apparently, they've been looking for electricity there for 13 years. As far as I can see, uh, it's reported that only 16 houses were electrified uh, in, in, in the last couple of months. Have you ramped that particular process up? Yes, we are definitely working on that. It's good that you are raising the issue of electricity. Because, you know, if you look at the manifest of the aims, it's got three parts. The first part is to give a full account on what the ANC managed to do over the past 27 years. The second part focuses on the challenges that we are confronted with. And the third part is the way forward, programs that we intend to embark on to address those challenges. In 1994, in the Northern Cape, it was only 36% of households that have access to the electricity grid, 36%. And today, 84% of households have got direct access to the grid. When I'm saying 86%, I simply mean that there's 16% of households, 14% of households that still don't have access to the grid. And we are working on that together with ESCOM to ensure that we expand access to electricity for households in the Northern Cape. But as I'm talking to you now, 86% of households here in the Northern Cape have got access to the grid which is a massive improvement. Whilst we are discussing all these challenges, which are real challenges confronted with on the ground, yeah. it's very important also to reflect on some of these major successes that we've managed. But here's the thing. Here's 1994, the thing. let me give you an example. Yeah. Let me give you an example. 1994, 40% of households in the Northern Cape had access to running water. Today, as I'm talking to you, 94% of households in this province have got access to running water. That's a major achievement. Yeah. Whilst, there are how they are, whilst, there are, whilst there are households that might be complaining that we don't have access to water, we must go to communal taps. But 94% of households have got water in the province. Yeah. And as I'm talking to you, 
more than 80% of households have got access to adequate sanitation, yeah. which, is, which was less than 40% right. in 1994. Right. So there is massive progress that have been made. Notwithstanding that, there are massive challenges that we are confronted with. And as the African National Congress, we committed that we are going to come up with plans in order to ensure that we address those backlogs. Yeah. You see, and we are that, 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 I, I, want, I want to come in there while you raise that we, issue. We are, because, we are the because only party that has got a manifesto that makes sense. But, but here's the, the thing. Yeah, yeah, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Premier. Yes. The, the, yes. the, 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 the ANC can have a manifesto that's good and well making promises. Uh, however, yes. it's, it's, it's quite important to know that the, the, the ANC is not only judged by the new promises that you're making, it's got to be judged yes. by having been in government and having not delivered on particular issues. I heard something which I thought quite interesting in this build-up to this uh, election. Someone w was saying that the, 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 the ANC is too much backward-looking as opposed to forward-looking. So they'll, they'll tell you about how many houses they electrified five years ago. But if you've got a, an informal settlement in Vietnam, uh, in, 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 in Kimberley saying we were supposed to have been a part of the list uh, of the households for the electrification program, uh, but we, we have seen none of that. We are being left literally in the dark and the municipality is just ignoring us. They would not necessarily be excited about what you're telling us now, about 86%, when they are still in the dark and they've been in the dark for, for 13 yes. years. Yes, I agree with you. In 2016, local government elections, we presented a manifesto. And these elections that will be taking place on the 1st of March is the judgment on what we said we'll do five years back. And linked to that judgment of what we said we'll do five years back is people inquiring about what is it that we intend to do in the next five years. So there is absolutely no way that you can run away from what we've managed to do. And that is what we've managed to do. 86% of households in the Northern Cape have got access to adequate sanitation. And if you look at our record over the past 27 years, 43,000 buckets were removed. You can't, you can't, you can't be dismissive of that. Whilst we understand that there are certain informal settlements we are, which are still using the bucket system, there is a program of eradication of bucket system because there is much roaming informal settlements where there is absolutely no service infrastructure. And we are looking at addressing that. There's massive programs with regard to ensuring that we increase the power capacity of our municipalities with regard to water supply, sanitation, and electricity, which, which are there, which are running, which are there in our plans. So the community of Verda, the challenges which they are sitting with, we are definitely going to respond to those challenges. Today, just today, we gave two residents of Rodepan, two, two residents of Rodepan, the title deed, one 82 years old and the other 76 years old. Yeah. What? So the program of service delivery is on track. Yeah. There are challenges which are there. There's been a major disruption of COVID, but you've got a government at work to try and address all these challenges. As you're talking about the addressing of the challenges, I mean, I saw an index conducted by an independent company, Soul Plucky's uh, municipality. You spent 8.8% .8 or so of your capital budget on maintenance of infrastructure, right? While you're spending, in comparison, 51% on, on, on salaries. Is, is that about service delivery or is that about uh, creating jobs and a competition for resources and employing as many people as possible? The fact that the issue that has been raised that we are, raised, we are, we are spending 51% of our budget in supply key on salaries, I don't think it's a correct reflection. I think supply key is one of the municipalities which is spending less than 45% of their budget on salaries. But let me come to the issue of maintenance. Currently, one of the issues that comes out very prominently from our manifest is to ensure that we invest adequate resources at maintaining the existing infrastructure. Because one of the biggest challenges that we are sitting with is aging infrastructure, particularly here in supply chain. You'll actually see that the bulk sewer infrastructure was installed here around 1967. And the capacity of that bulk sewer infrastructure was for 8,000 households. Now you speak of a secondary city with 
almost 40,000 households that had to be carried by a bulk solar infrastructure, which was meant for 8,000 households. Because for the apartheid regime, flushing toilets was only for white communities. It was not for black. You go to Haleshua, you go to Rodapan, you go to Corval, all these areas have got flushing toilets, have got adequate sanitation. So with regard to expanding access to this service, which is adequate sanitation, we've made major strides, we've made tremendous strides. But one of the challenges that we are sitting with is how do we expand the existing bulk infrastructure to ensure that we are not sitting with sewer bursts right around the city. And we are working on that program. That's the reason why just about six months back, the provincial government gave Sofriti municipality 500 million rent out of our own savings when we cut on the stage in the system, yeah. 500 million rent to attend to all these problems. You come here to Sofriti, you'll find out there's contractors right all over the town, fixing potholes, there's work taking place to improve and expand the bulk infrastructure of this town. Yeah. So there is work that we are doing. We are not only having these things in the manifesto, all right. but on the ground, as I'm speaking to you, without there being an election today, yeah. What is taking place? I, 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 I'll take a break, and, and I, I want to come back to exactly what you're raising, the issue of the 500 million uh, for, 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 for the improvements, uh, because only in April, the community of Litabo uh, Park area, uh, we're actually protesting. They're not sure even that 500 million, whether they'll be able to see the benefits of that. But I want you to respond uh, when we come back from the break, because I'm so NC chairperson in the Northern Cape with us tonight on In Focus. We'll take you live with your questions and your comments. 072 If you live in any of these areas uh, that uh, the, the MEC is uh, talking about, if you are in uh, the Colville area, if you're in uh, the Vet Down area, if um, you're in any of those informal settlements where the MEC is saying we're ending our title deeds and there is in construction underway even as we speak, Give us a shout. We want to hear from you what your experience is uh, on the ground. We'll continue in a moment. Welcome back. Live with us tonight on In Focus here on News of Africa, Channel 405, NC Chairperson in the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani Sol. My guest tonight, and uh, we are discussing, of course, a range of burning issues uh, with him, including those that are coming from you tonight. We're taking them on WhatsApp. I uh, see many questions. We'll put them to uh, the uh, chairperson of the ANC in uh, the province in a moment. 072-110-5584. That's where uh, you are sending those uh, through. So, Prima, before the break, I was saying Litabo Park area uh, in in April, I think it was in April of this year that there was a, a service delivery protest there. They mentioned this 500 million that you've just spoken about, but they're saying where they are living, for example, uh, they are still suffering from continuous power cuts, but not only that, switch pipe bursts, and uh, we're seeing a whole lot of other messages coming through, which I'm going to put to you around the, the sewage situation there. But uh, talk, to us, uh, talk to us about the Litabo Park area and what your plans are. Then. Yes, let with, with Litabo Park, we've already, I'm sure the community members who attend community meetings there, they know the programs that we've communicated. We'll be moving in with ESCOM to put in electricity at Litabo Park. And the Department of Human Settlement has got a program to formalize the informal settlements there. It's an informal settlement area. In order for you to put infrastructure, you must formalize it. So Department of Human Settlement is currently busy with the work to formalize Tabo Park and with ESCOM will be moving in to put in electricity. And that has been communicated to the community. And uh, that's work that is taking place and uh, it's work that will be finished and I'm certain most of these things I'm talking about will be finished before the end of, before the end of, before the end of the year. But the 500 million rent which the provincial government invested in infrastructure in, in supply, it's in the main around maintenance of the current infrastructure because it's aging infrastructure which malfunctions, which spills so high in the streets. And we want to stop that. You sit with water bursts all over the town and that's what we are currently working on stopping. You can't be in supply for five minutes that you won't see a contractor fixing potholes because this is our capital town. Yeah. We need to make massive investment in infrastructure. It's actually the middle of the Northern Cape. So that is what we are working towards to ensure that we turn around this town, we turn around the secondary city that we have in the province. 
And even when investors come to the Northern Cape, they should be impressed when they see what is actually happening to our secondary city, which is the capital of the province. What do you make of the fact that the IEC reports a upsurge? In fact, one of the highest number of independent candidates, I suppose, uh, next to, if not uh, uh, the, the Northwest and at, at Teguin. I think you've got about 70 independent candidates in that particular province. Is that an indication of a thriving democracy or an indication of a society or community that is uh, not trusting of politicians anymore? You, you can explain that in basically in various ways. Uh, obviously, in South Africa, we've got a liberal democracy uh, where each and every individual has got the right to vote and stand for position. And uh, a liberal democracy can go either way. It can go to a degenerative democracy where people feel that there's not adequate space for them to exercise their rights or it can become a deliberative democracy where each and every individual feels that the space is open and they can freely exercise their rights. So an increase of independent candidates, unlike any other part maybe in Africa, it actually tells you that our democracy is maturing into deliberative democracy, where people look at political participation beyond political parties. Because where if you sit with an instance where people look at political participation only through political parties that might lead to degenerative democracy but in an instance where people look for political participation beyond the existence of political parties is deliberative democracy where people say we can directly as an individual engage with the system so it is a positive indication that democracy in south africa is maturing which we should welcome all of us where people feel that outside the purview of political parties, they can actively engage with a democratic system in the country. That is, mature, that is maturation of the system. But in the Northern Cape, again, uh, independent candidates don't have a history of winning once. Each and every local government elections we had, by elections that we had, there's always independent candidates and they don't have a history of winning once. Uh, I know only of one independent candidate that has won a while in the Northern Cape. I don't know of any others. So, which means the electorate of the Northern Cape has not really warmed up to independent candidates. Just for the past two and a half years, we had about 43 by-elections in the province. The ANC has won 41 of those by-elections, and in all those by-elections, there were independent candidates. 41 of the 43 by-elections that took place over the past two and a half years, ANC 141. So we are as good as our last game. And in terms of our last game, we've won 41 of 43 by-elections. And I don't see that trend changing on the 1st of November. Let me take some questions coming through tonight on WhatsApp, 72 This one from Anonymous saying, what does Dr. Zamani Sol have to say about the Soul Plucky Municipality's plans to rectify the sewage problems outside the platform Dain on the R31 there? That is already an environmental disaster. There's already been vehicles that landed in the sewage dam there. Tepo from Kimberley, I have a question for Dr. Yeah, Zamani Sol. Should, should in terms I of sport, uh, let me read all of them. I'll get you to respond now. All right. In terms of sports, uh, what are the plans for the development of sports and their facilities there? Because Kimberley youth are swamped in drugs and alcohol, and they are also robbers. Yeah. Norm Stein Kimberley saying, Soul Plaiki has redirected its sewage uh, to Platfontein Conference Center, and that poses a threat to the businesses there and the over flooding of the R31 road connecting Barclay West to Kimberley. Is there any plans to fix that, uh, Dr. Zamani So, uh, Why yeah. are the candidates that don't have big posters, especially in the Bababello, uh, is it because they are elected by the community and not identified by the provincial secretary? These candidates must uh, see for themselves about their campaign without the regional help. Sepiso. And uh, Butselo from Kimberley, when is Dr. Zamani Soul and the police going to uh, do something about the Nigerians who are selling drugs to our kids and human trafficking there? Is not even uh, one camera in Kimberley around the CBD. Is he aware of the illegal activities going on in our town, especially at the taxi rank? Let's start there. 
Yeah. No, but there's there's an issue which was raised around the deep posters. Uh, this weekend on Sunday, just yesterday, I was in Uppington uh, doing some organizational work. I saw those posters, uh, small posters, which the candidate made those posters herself. And, and that is not because of any form of marginalization or discrimination of the candidate. It's just a challenge that we had with regard to distribution and printing of posters. I raised that issue with our provincial election team and they are currently giving attention to it. The other issue of R31, I think uh, as the movement, we should be upfront and apologize to people of South Lightyear about what is happening there on R31. But everyone who drives past R31, you will see there's a contractor there that is busy fixing that. And the reason for that is a spillage because of malfunctioning of the Hoka pump, of the Hoka pump, sewer pump. And all the challenges which we've been encountering with the Hoka sewer pump, those challenges have been addressed. So there is no longer spillage to R31. And that thing will be addressed. We've got a contractor there on site to ensure that the road is safe, R31 is safe, it does not collapse under the under the lake which is currently there. There's work that is taking place and we are going to address that matter as soon as possible. There's another very important issue which was raised around sports, whether we are investing adequately on sports infrastructure because young people in the province resort to drugs and alcohol and all of that. One of the issues that I want to raise is that we are sitting with major challenges. Uh, with the advent of COVID, I did not want to bring COVID as an excuse in this discussion, but it is a reality that we are confronted with. With the advent of COVID, we had to redirect most of our resources to the Department of Health in order to strengthen its capacity to respond to COVID, to save lives, to curb the transmission of the virus, and also to ensure that there's adequate shelter for people who have to get into isolation and quarantine. We've directed most of our resources into that. We've also directed bulk of our resources. That's the reason why these past two years, it has been two years of reprioritization of the budget to the Department of Education to ensure that our children go back to school in a much safer environment, uh, try to protect them from COVID. And as well as our educators and people who are working at a schooling, at a schooling environment. So that in itself had a negative and a very adverse impact on monies that will have to get into improving our sports infrastructure and a whole lot of other things. But this is one of the issues that really concerns us to ensure that we put in place, we have adequate amenities of life where young people can go and enjoy themselves and not indulge in drugs and, and, and alcohol. There's an issue also which was raised on police and, uh, and the Nigerian on policing in Nigeria and the ones who are selling drugs. I think this is one of the problems that we are encountering nationally. And police in the province with the report that we had, uh, that the report that we had, uh, they gave us in March, one of the things that they've indicated there's increase in arrest of people who are actually selling drugs in the province. And let's welcome that. And what we actually need to do is to strengthen the work of the police to ensure that we really curb and stop and disrupt the situation of drugs in our community because the target is young people. And if we don't do that, we'll be destroying the future of this country. Thank you very much. All right, that's uh, the chairperson of the ANC in the Northern Cape province there, Dr. Zamani Sol. Of course, the conversation continues. You can let us in on what your thoughts are tonight and your comments and questions. 072-110-5584. You can tweet us at Newsroom405. When we continue next, in their manifesto, the ANC, the party is saying they would subject now mayors and senior managers to lifestyle audits to limit the scope of corruption. But not only that, they were requiring mayors and councillors to sign performance agreements. We'll hear from Dr. Zamani Sol. Does he think this will work? It's not a new promise, by the way. In 2010, they already said they want mayors to sign a performance agreement. But without monitoring and intervening at the right time, what does that help? The conversation continues in a moment. Stay with us.
Mr. Baxter, coverage on elections uh, 2021 continues as uh, we build up to November 1st. We're with the chairperson of the ANC in the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani So, my guest tonight. And, of course, we're discussing burning issues and some issues that you are raising, bringing them up on WhatsApp tonight. Uh, questions and comments on 072-110-5584. Taking your tweets also tonight at Newsroom 405. As I mentioned before the break, Dr. Uh, Zamani, uh, you mentioned in the ANC's manifesto that the party would now subject mayors and senior managers to lifestyle audits which have not happened, quite honestly. Uh, even when you came in, a number of uh, promises were made, I mean, including uh, uh, in, in, in dealing with corruption and wasteful expenditure, uh, and uh, the question of lifestyle audits was part of what uh, you, you, you promised you would do. But not only that, it goes further, requiring mayors and councillors to sign performance agreements. Agreed, maybe that would be a good thing, but without a measure and a degree uh, of monitoring, and intervening at the right time and holding people accountable, it really is an empty promise, is it not? Yes, I, I, I firmly agree with you. And uh, I, I think uh, I would just, uh, one of the things which I think is that uh, the people of South Africa must take our gesture around issues of local government seriously. Uh, we agree as the African National Congress that local government has been a weak link in the chain of social transformation and our development trajectory in the country. It has been a weak link. There are challenges in the provincial government, the challenges in the national government, but not to an extent of the scale at which these challenges found expression in local government. And that happens at a very critical layer of service delivery, because we all say local government is at the core phase of service delivery. That is the reason why, as the African National Congress, we are taking a completely different attitude and a no-nonsense approach around municipal leadership, and particularly political leadership. I'm, I'm certain you've heard the president mentioning it more than once, that all those who will be mayors and speakers in municipalities, they will be subjected to a grueling interview. We are introducing an element of meritocracy. People must have the necessary gravitas to be a mayor of the African National Congress, to be a speaker of the African National Congress. Another layer that we said we need to look into seriously is strengthening of the technical capacity of our municipalities. We need municipal managers with adequate experience and the right qualifications. CFOs and all senior managers in municipalities. That is a no-nonsense attitude that we've adopted around local government. And this time around, there's absolutely no way that we can fail our communities with regard to that. Because we've experienced the worst anger in our communities around issues that are taking place at local government. And we are the first as the African National Congress to say that the manner in which local government is structured the manner in which it works, it's actually the weak link in the chain of social transformation and development. The issue of um, performance agreements with all our mayors, there will be performance agreements with all our, not only the mayors, but also with ANC chief whip, with ANC speakers as well. So that everybody, when he gets elected by his or her council on the mandate of the ANC to become a mayor speaker or a chief whip, those individuals, they know exactly what is it that the ANC expects from them. And there will be proper monitoring and evaluation of their performance. We have to develop that capacity and already work is taking place to ensure that the ANC is in a position to evaluate performance of, 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 of our different municipalities. So we are introducing, in a very gradual and incremental manner, we are introducing the element of meritocracy that we don't just get anybody to become a mayor of a town, but we don't get somebody who's got the right qualifications, who's got the political acumen, and who's got the overall political management yeah. of immune capacities to manage the municipalities. Those are some of the issues that we are looking at. And I think we are making great progress to do that. We started with the nomination of candidates and already Lutuli House have appointed teams that will be conducting those interviews. Yeah. I'm certain Lutuli House have already announced the different teams. 
that they have appointed, they will go right throughout the breadth and length of the country, yeah. interviewing all mayor are, are, are you? And, uh, is the ANS expecting to face an, an uphill battle as it tries to, to do that? I mean, if you, you listen to the uh, uh, clip I played earlier on, uh, people are talking of Boko Haram, for example, uh, who, who are uh, imposing candidates and so on and so forth, uh, and they want their own mayors in those positions. And it, it, it really has got nothing to do with service delivery from what I am seeing, but other uh, issues like competition for resources, really, because a councillor job has become a, a way of living. It's to, to appoint a mayor, a speaker, and a chief whip of a municipality, it's a political process. And there will be political permutation from different interest groups. But this time around, we should not bother ourselves and get ourselves entangled and distracted by those political permutations. What we should be focusing on, and that's what I think Lutuli House is doing, is to focus on ensuring that the best of the best, the best of the best become mayors in our municipalities, people with adequate political acumen and skill to exercise oversight and give strategic leadership to those municipalities. There will be political permutation. I don't think there is a single municipality where there won't be political permutation because to some extent, some members of the movement are driven by self-interest, wanting a friend or his own force to become, to, become, to become the mayor or a speaker or all of that. But we should actually not focus on that. We should ask ourselves on this list of 30 ANC councillors, who's the best here? Who is it that the community will feel comfortable with? Who is it that will be able to give strategic leadership and exercise proper oversight on the municipality? That's what we should, but political permutation Tabo, will be there, will be there, and we'll have to manage that without losing focus on what we want to achieve. If society is to really take the ANC seriously on that question of uh, renewal and, and, and doing things right right now, with all the noise that's happening in, in the Eastern Cape, should the step-aside rule be applying there right now? Renewal is taking place. And uh, I don't think there's any South African that can escape. Cases are getting investigated. People are getting charged. People are <clears throat> dragged to courts. That is what is happening even ANC senior leadership. And that's part and parcel of our renewal campaign where we say we must combat corruption. We are actually right at the pinnacle, at the cutting edge of the battle to fight corruption. The ANC is leading that. And you must tell me which political party or a former liberation movement on the African continent that you know of that have such an express commitment at fighting corruption, and it's at the pinnacle of that battle. It's only the African National Congress. We are fighting corruption to an extent that that fight against corruption is disrupting the operations of the movement. It's causing chaos within the movement. It's causing instability in the ANC. And we are prepared to take that price of instability because we are fighting corruption. So the issue of the Eastern Cape, I think Eastern Cape will be in a better position to respond to it. But one thing I can tell you is that there are guidelines. And I am certain that all members of the ANC will abide by the guidelines that were adopted by the NSC. Guidelines are very simple. Number one, they say, if you are charged, you step aside. Number two, if there's serious allegations against you, you go to the, you go to the Integrity Commission. I am certain if any of these two ensues in the Eastern Cape. That leadership will subject themselves to it. So tell me of any other party in the country <clears throat> that has made such commitment to the people of South Africa and it leaves that commitment. It's only the African National Congress at a high cost, at a high cost of disruption within our own ranks. People who are very much discontent with it we are causing disruption inside the ANC, but we have to manage those disruptions yeah. in the would, best interest would, would of the be, national project. Would, national would you be willing to take that to disruption? the quality of lives of the people of South Africa. If you yourself as a premier were cited in a public protector's report, would you be willing to take that disruption and step aside? If, if I'm cited in the public protector's report for wrongdoing, I will go to the, I will go to the, to the, to the, to the integrity commission. If I'm cited, if today there's a report that comes out 
inciting and wrongdoing, I'll go to the Integrity Commission. If I receive a charge sheet now from the law enforcement agents that I'm charged for any offense, I will submit my letter now and step aside now. And that is, that is the decision of the NEC, that's the decision of our last conference to demonstrate its commitment to renewal. If I'm charged now, I'm talking to you now, Tom, as soon as I receive the charge sheet, yeah. I'm writing the letter, I step aside. Yeah. What do you make then of, of, if, of, of your fellow comrades who are saying, no, this is a political witch hunt? They will, the comrades will try to label it in any form. But the fact of the matter is there's a national conference that took a decision around issues of renewal. That national conference took a decision around issues of renewal. They say corruption in the public and private sector poses an ex existential crisis to the movement. It's an existential threat. If we don't tackle it head on and vigorously, this might actually take the ANC out of power. And people of South Africa, if you look in terms of the, their attitudes, in actual fact, they are not happy with all these allegations and perception of corruption around the African National Congress. You see, when we speak about corruption and the image of the movement, it seems to me people take this thing very lightly. The African National Congress is the heritage of the people of South Africa, those who are members and those who are not members. This is, this is a living heritage of the people of South Africa and us who are in charge of the ANC now, who are leaders in the African National Congress. We should always be conscious about that, that this organization we are privileged to lead is a living heritage of the people of South Africa. When OR made a call in the 80s, that we must render South Africa ungovernable. People who are not even members of the ANC embarked on that program. All the calls which the ANC made during the struggle for liberation of South Africa, people participated who are not ANC members, who don't even associate with the ANC, participated in all those programs. And post-1994, every South African takes South Africa, takes the African National Congress is the living heritage of this country. So we don't have a right. We don't have a right to destroy what we've not established. We've never established this movement. We've contributed very little to build its image and its reputation. It's a very powerful brand. Today, as I'm talking to you, the ANC in, in this country is in charge of more than 90% of municipalities, is in charge of national government, is in charge of eight provinces out of nine in close to 5,000 ward councillors that we have in this country, the ANC commands about 4,000 of those ward councillors. It's a big, powerful brand. And not even a single one of us, notwithstanding what position you occupy, you've got the right to deride that, that, that image of the movement. You don't have a right to spoil the image of the movement. So we don't have the right to do that. So if you get involved in any activities yeah. that seeks to damage the image of the movement. You must be held accountable for Dr. it. Dr. Zamani, so we are out of time. Thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight and making the time to talk to us. Chairperson of the ANC in the Northern Cape, uh, Dr. Zamani, so.